today on Grace to You. His disciples came by night and stole him away while we were asleep. Really? So how do you know that if you were asleep? You're going to have to do better than that. The lie proved the resurrection. Jesus was raised. Right at the end of this tremendous account about the resurrection comes the great what? Commission. Is Jesus alive? Then go tell. What in the world makes us so embarrassed about the gospel? For I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. What is often overlooked in the glories of the cross and Good Friday and the glories of the resurrection on Sunday is what happened in between, and that is the burial of our Lord. Understanding His burial will elevate your confidence in everything else about that weekend, His death and His resurrection. It will elevate your confidence in the Scripture and in the sovereign power of God. Now to give you the full story, I need to include uh, all four Gospels. We're going to see what the Gospels tell us about the burial of Jesus that is significant. We're going to look at the burial from the vantage point of the indifferent soldiers. And then we're going to look at the burial from the vantage point of the loving saints. And then we're going to look at the burial of Jesus from the vantage point of the apostate spiritual leaders. So we're going to get three perspectives on the burial of our Lord, and we'll see the providence of God at work. First of all, divine providence in the action of the indifferent soldiers. You can turn now in your Bible to John 19. John 19, and we will begin at verse 30, John 19, verse 30. This is, as you know, the final statement of our Lord before He bows His head. When He had received the sour wine, He said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit, having also said, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Then in verse 31, we pick up the subject for this morning. Then the Jews, because it was the day of preparation, so that the bodies would not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for that Sabbath was a high day asked Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first man, first thief, and of the other who was crucified with Him. But coming to Jesus, when they saw that He was already dead, they did not break His legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and immediately blood and water came out. And he who has seen has testified, and his testimony is true, and he knows that he is telling the truth, so that you also may believe. For these things came to pass to fulfill the Scripture, not a bone of him shall be broken. And again, another Scripture says, They shall look on Him whom they pierced." Normally death is a surprise, at least the very moment of death. Normally the person dying is not in control of that moment. But Jesus was in control of the moment of His death. He said, it is finished. Father, into Your hands I commend My spirit, and He gave up His life. Back in the tenth chapter of John, He said, no one takes My life from Me, I lay it down of Myself. 
And by the way, Revelation 1.18 says of Him, He has the keys of death. He could unlock death even for Himself anytime He chose. He gave up His own life sooner than normal. It was not um, necessarily the average, but typically people hung on a cross for two to three days. He was on the cross for six hours. From nine o'clock in the morning until about three o'clock in the afternoon, and the thieves crucified on each side of Him, as we just read, were still alive when He had already died, which is pretty remarkable because He was sinless and they were wretched and sinful, and sin just in its presence takes a toll, but at the level they engaged in it probably took a greater toll on their physicality, whereas there was no toll of sin on the physicality of Jesus, and we would have expected Him to live a whole lot longer than one who had been burdened with the fallenness of Adam's sin and then His own transgressions. But Jesus died before even the thieves died. All these three men hanging in the sky that day outside Jerusalem needed to come down off the cross, and they needed to come down right then. Why? Because as you'll notice in verse 31, it was the day of preparation. That's the day before the Sabbath. That's Friday. So that the bodies would not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. Why did they care whether those people were still hanging there on the Sabbath? Well, it goes back to Deuteronomy chapter 21. Let me read you a couple of verses, verses 22 and 23. If a man has committed a sin worthy of death, and he is put to death, and you hang him on a tree, his corpse shall not hang all night on the tree, but you shall surely bury him on the same day, for he who is hanged is accursed of God, so that you do not defile your land which the Lord your God gives you as an inheritance." So God had given them the reality that if they had executed someone for a just cause, They didn't leave that person hanging there until the next day. Now this is even more significant when the next day is the Sabbath day. They did not want three bodies hanging on crosses on the Sabbath day. And this was not just any Sabbath, this was Passover. And so all three would have desecrated the Sabbath. They would have desecrated this Passover Sabbath if left on the cross, dead or alive, to leave the bodies on the cross in the eyes of the Jewish leaders would have been to defile the land. This is something of an insight into their hypocrisy. They didn't want dead bodies defiling the land, even though one of those bodies belong to the Son of God and the Messiah whom they had sentenced to death. By the way, they had already had a conversation with Pilate and at some point entered his praetorium, which would have defiled them for certain by their own ceremonial tradition to enter into any Gentile place. Familiar with crucifixion, they knew the way to speed it up was pretty simple. Verse 31, they asked Pilate to break their, to give them permission to break their legs. What they would do is take a mallet and smash the femur on each leg. This is called crucifragium in the Latin. It involved smashing the femur of the victim's legs with an iron mallet. And this gesture made death almost immediate because the body would slump and could no longer push itself up on the nails uh, through the feet and therefore get some breath and they would asphyxiate rather rapidly 
as well as the shock and the blood loss, the asphyxiation would take their lives very rapidly. You'll notice the man's name is Pilate, who was the governor at that time, the procurator under Tiberius for a period of from about 26 to 36 A.D., so through the time of the death of our Lord. So they asked if they could break those femurs so those men would die before the day previous to Sabbath was over. And again, this was the day of preparation. This is Friday, and it's important that these bodies be down off the cross to the Jews before the Sabbath begins or on Friday, and that's important. And that they might, at the end of verse 31, be taken away, removed. So the soldiers came, having been given the permission, and broke the legs of the first man and of the other who was crucified with Him. But coming to Jesus, when they saw that He was already dead, they didn't break His legs. But one of the soldiers pierced His side with a spear, and immediately blood and water came out. Now, it's important to recognize that these Roman soldiers were executioners by trade. They knew who was dead and who wasn't. They knew Jesus was dead. And to demonstrate that, they pierced His side with a spear, and out came blood and water. This is a mixture of blood and lymphatic fluid that could be the result of a cardiac episode. Psalm 69 has references clearly to the cross, and one of them in verse 20 is that reproach has broken my heart. Could it have been that the cause of the Lord's death was that His heart just exploded? So they found Him dead and they didn't break His legs. Verse 35 then tells us that John was there, the writer, and he saw it. And he who has seen has testified, John meaning himself, and his testimony is true, and he knows that he is telling the truth so that you also may believe. John is saying, I want you to know I was there, I was an eyewitness, and Jesus was dead. Jesus was dead. That was important. Important because of two Old Testament prophecies. Verse 36, the first one is from Exodus 12, 46, Numbers 9, 12 and even Psalm 34, not a bone of him shall be broken. If he had not been dead, they would have violated that prophecy. He would not have fulfilled that prophecy. He would not be the Messiah and God not in control of everything. Passover lamb, and the reason I refer back to Exodus and Numbers, Passover lamb could have no broken bone, a picture of the final lamb. And in other Scripture, verse 37, Zechariah 12, 10, they shall look on Him whom they pierced. So it was prophesied that not a bone of Him would be broken, as is the case of the Passover lamb and that they would look on Him, the Jews, one day in the future, Zechariah saying, whom they pierced. John says, I was there. Not a bone was broken, and he was pierced. So the action of not only our Lord giving up His life, but the action of the soldiers on the body of Christ were under divine control and authenticate the Old Testament prophecies, authenticate the Messiahship of Jesus, set up the reality of His resurrection as the Son of God, and demonstrate the sovereign providence of God over every detail. 
So as we come to the actual removal of the body from the cross and its placement in the tomb, I want you to turn to Mark 15. Mark 15. This is amazing. Verse 42 of Mark 15, when evening had already come, which means it's in the afternoon because it is the preparation day. Again, it tells us this is Friday. That is the day before the Sabbath. Some people try to say Jesus was crucified on Wednesday or Thursday. No, it's the day before the Sabbath. Joseph of Arimathea came, a prominent member of the council who himself was waiting for the kingdom of God, and he gathered up courage and went in before Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Pilate wondered if he was dead by this time, and summoning the centurion, he questioned him as to whether he was already dead. And ascertaining this from the centurion, he granted the body to Joseph. Joseph bought a linen cloth, took him down, wrapped him in the linen cloth, and laid him in a tomb which had been hewn out in the rock. And he rolled a stone against the entrance of the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, were looking on to see where he was laid. We go from divine providence in the action of the indifferent soldiers to divine providence in the action of loving saints. And we meet Joseph of Arimathea. Luke says this about him. He was a good and righteous man. Same word used by the centurion to refer to Jesus. Truly, this man was righteous. This man was the Son of God. Just exactly what prompted Joseph to want his body and to have the privilege of burying it. What is driving this man? Simply God. He's compelled by God. He's being driven by God. He's moving at a divine speed, not just to give Jesus an honorable burial, a proper burial, not just to do it all uh, with as much dignity as could possibly be remaining for that kind of condition, but rather he is moving on God's time to get Jesus in the grave on Friday because he has to be there three days. Matthew 12:40, the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. And a day and a night constituted any part of the twenty-four hours. So he took him down in verse 46, being compelled by God but not even knowing it. But he put, first of all, a linen cloth out, then took him down and wrapped him in the linen cloth and laid him in a tomb which had been hewn out in the rock, and he rolled a stone against the entrance of the tomb. Mark says he did it all himself. John says he took the body away himself. He carried his Savior. Now none of the gospels say that Joseph had any spices, but John tells us they were brought by another person who just happened to show up with spices. John 19, 39. Well, back to 38, just to set the stage. Joseph of Arimathea, disciple of Jesus, secret one for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take the body of Jesus. Pilate granted permission. He came and took away his body. Nicodemus, familiar name? John 3, the teacher of Israel that came to Jesus by night, also came, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about a hundred-pound weight. 
So they took the body of Jesus and bound it in linen wrappings with the spices, as is the burial custom of the Jews. Somewhere between John 3 and John 19, somewhere between meeting Jesus the first time and seeing His dead body, Nicodemus had become a follower of Jesus. He had been born again by the Holy Spirit. So that takes us back to Mark 15 again, and together now they lay Jesus in the tomb. The spices are placed on Him, and He's put in the tomb, tomb hewn out of rock. Matthew 27, 60 says it was Joseph's own tomb. Matthew also calls Joseph a rich man. John says, I think it's chapter 19, verse 42, that it was very near Golgotha. And they laid him in a tomb, essentially, which no one had ever been laid in. And then Joseph of Arimathea rolled a stone against the entrance of the tomb. John 19.41 says this tomb was in a garden. That's why it's called even today the garden tomb. So we see the action of loving saints added to the action of indifferent soldiers, all demonstrating the action of God providentially as He has His Son buried on Friday. And that brings us to the third group that play a role in this burial the indifferent soldiers and the loving saints, and then divine providence in the action of the hateful spiritual leaders. And let's go back to where we started in reading Scripture, back to Matthew chapter 27, and we'll wrap it up. Matthew chapter 27, 62 is the verse. On the next day, the day after the preparation, the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered together with Pilate and said, Sir, we remember that when he was still alive, that deceiver said, after three days I'm going to rise again. Now wait a minute. The day after the preparation is the Sabbath. What are they doing in a Gentile house on the Sabbath? What are they doing with Pilate? Their traditions were very conveniently set aside because they're worried. We remember that when He was still alive, that deceiver said, after three days I am to rise again. Therefore give orders for the grave to be made secure until the third day, otherwise His disciples may come and steal Him away and say to the people, He has risen from the dead, and the last deception will be worse than the first. Pilate said to them, you have a guard, go. Make it as secure as you know how. And they went and made the grave secure, and along with the guard they set a seal on the stone. We're going to make sure he never comes out of that grave. They're going to make sure that there's not a worse deception than the deceiver Jesus alive by the disciples stealing His body. So the grave was sealed. Some people say Jesus wasn't dead on the cross and that's why He came out of the grave, really. That's impossible. The soldiers knew He was dead. Some people claim the women went to the wrong grave and they went to one that was empty. That's not possible because we know His body was anointed with spices. Some people say, well, the disciples stole His body, really. They say, well, how could they steal His body if the Romans set a guard there? Well, they couldn't. So they had to bribe the soldiers. I love this. Chapter 28, Jesus is gone. 
tombs rolled away. The soldiers come into town, the guard in verse 11, report to the chief priests all that had happened. And when they had assembled with the elders and consulted together, they gave a large sum of money to the soldiers. There's a word for this. Bribery. And you're supposed to say this, His disciples came by night and stole Him away while we were asleep. Really? So how do you know that if you were asleep? <laughs> you're going to have to do better than that stupid. <laughs> and if this should come to the governor's ears, when you tell that stupid story, we will win him over and keep you out of trouble. And they took the money and did as they had been instructed. And this story was widely spread among the Jews and is to this day. The lie proved the resurrection. Jesus was raised, as we read. And He said this at the end of 28, "'All authority has been given to Me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. And lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age." Right at the end of this tremendous account about the resurrection comes the great what? Commission. Is Jesus alive? Then go tell. Father, we thank You for Your Word. Thank You for filling our hearts with joy this morning, and may that transfer itself into an eagerness to go and make disciples and let the world know the truth of the risen Christ, how desperate they are, how lost they are. This is their only hope. Use us mightily in this day to proclaim Christ and Him crucified and risen and coming again. And for His glory we ask, amen. Thousands of hours of content are available through our website free of charge. By visiting gty.org, you will have access to audio, video, transcripts and other resources collected from over 50 years of Pastor John's preaching ministry. Once there, you can also download the Study Bible app or search for where grace to you can be heard daily on the radio in your area. Thank you for your partnership with us. If you have any questions about the ministry of John MacArthur or grace to you, our operators would be happy to assist you and are available by calling 888-57-GRACE. That's 888-57-GRACE or through email at letters at gty.org. On behalf of Pastor John, thank you for joining us today. We'll see you next time on Grace To You.